Lux presents Hollywood. <music> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Deborah Carr and Stuart Granger in King Solomon's Mines. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Many years ago, a legend existed that deep in unexplored Africa were the fabulous King Solomon's mines. That a man would be willing to gamble his life to find them was understandable. But for a woman to undertake such a perilous journey into an unknown land was unbelievable. But that is the basis for one of Metro Goldwyn Mayer's greatest screen successes. And recreating their original roles, we have two of Hollywood's foremost stars, Stuart Granger and Deborah Carr. And whenever you see a star on a dressing room door in our motion picture studios, you can rest assured in these dressing rooms of glamorous screen beauties, the favorite beauty care is Lux Toilet Soap. Refreshing Lux facials bring such quick new beauty to skin. It's no wonder that our loveliest Hollywood stars are devoted to Lux Soap for their daily beauty care. Now, King Solomon's Minds, starring Deborah Carr as Beth Curtis and Stuart Granger as Alan Quatermain. We reached Africa in March of 1897. My sister Elizabeth and I, we journeyed at once to the Kenya Protectorate and there solicited the help of a government official to find the guide we were looking for, a man named Alan Quatermain. Yes, it seems they've heard about you, Alan, and they're willing to pay almost anything. Thanks, Eric, but I've taken out my last safari. I've about made up my mind to send for my son. He's seven years old now, and I... Bring the boy out here, but this is no life for a child. Well, I've thought about that, too. And if I don't send for him, well, then I'll just go back to England. And what would you do there? Become a shopkeeper? You've built a career here, Alan. You've attained the happiest fate a man can have in this world. To be the best at something. Here, yeah, have another drink. No, 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 I mean it. This man and his sister, they've heard about you in London. Alan, did you ever meet a man named Henry Curtis? Curtis? Yes, there was a fellow named Curtis about a year and a half ago. He wanted to go through unexplored country, some wild notion about a lost diamond mine. Well? Well, I turned him down, of course. That's the last I saw of him. Why? Because he disappeared. It's his wife who wants to hire you to lead a searching party. His wife and her brother. A woman on a safari? No, well, thank you. Besides, I meant what I said. Well, I can't force you to go, can I? And if you're serious about going back to England, well, perhaps I can be of some help. Thanks, Eric. Well, I'll stop by your office in the morning. I was in Eric Master's office that following day when Quatermain came in. I had insisted on waiting there to see him. I told him it was useless, Alan, but he's a most persistent fellow. I came all the way from England, Mr. Quatermain. The least you can do is to give me information. Well, if I can, I'll be glad to. The last word we had from my brother-in-law was a letter which he sent from here. He said he was heading west into unexplored territory. Mr. Masters tells me that you refused to guide him. I most certainly refused. Why? Because when I die, Mr. Good, I hope it will be doing something slightly more sensible than trying to run down a legend about a lost diamond mine. You mean the country's dangerous? I don't know if any white men have ever been in that region before, but I do know that none ever returned to tell about it. Yes, Mr. Good, it's dangerous. But you must admit, Alan, that as far as we know... Henry Curtis could still be alive. Well, as a captive, perhaps, but the chances are very slim. My sister feels if there's any chance at all, she must pursue it. She's had a bad time lately. She can't sleep nights, wakes up screaming, dreams about him wandering in the jungle. Surely you've made other inquiries about him, Mr. Good. All we've been able to learn is that Henry was headed through the Kalawana country. Kalawana country? Well, what about it? Thousands of square miles, Mr. Good. Even the natives are afraid to go near it. And how would you proceed to get there? We have a map. Henry sent us a copy of the map he planned to follow, here. I tell you, there are no maps. There isn't a native village or river recorded beyond the Kalawana region. These sort of maps are constantly being peddled to greenhorns from Timbuktu to Johannesburg. You may be right, of course. 
Henry said he bought the original map to King Solomon's Mines from an Arab trader who claimed it was 400 years old. The Flying Dutchman, Mr. Good. Captain Kidd's treasure. All right, there is no diamond mine. But at least the map tells us where to look for Henry. And with your help, we'll follow it. Mr. Good, I assure you, you have absolutely no idea of the dangers of such a trip. Neither have I. But at least I can guess. My advice to you is to take your overwrought sister back to London as quickly as possible. I'm sorry I can't be a... I told Elizabeth about my meeting with Quartermain. She left at once to see him herself. My brother told me your reasons for turning us down, Mr. Quartermain, but there was one argument he neglected to use. What was that? Money. Oh, well, that's a very good argument, Mrs. Curtis. I'm willing to pay almost anything. I can't understand your determination to go on with this foolishness. Well, for one thing, it's quite possible that you're exaggerating the dangers. With proper equipment and your services, we should be able to manage. I'm not afraid. Your courage does you no credit, Mrs. Curtis. It's the result of ignorance. What is your usual fee for a safari? Oh, 200 pounds and all expenses. I wouldn't undertake this one for 500. Would you for 5,000? 5,000? Oh, that's a great deal of money. I mean it. It's more than I could save in a lifetime. Would you pay it, win or lose? Yes. Even if you backed out before we got a tenth of the way? You expect me to back out, don't you? Oh, I'm counting on it. I'll pay you 5,000 in advance and a bonus of 500 at the end, whether I back out or not. You're weakening, aren't you? You've half decided to accept. Oh, I've fully decided to accept. I'd try almost anything for that much cash. Well, then you're not so certain after all that we'd never return. I'm just as certain as ever. And yet you'd go? Mrs. Curtis, the average life of a man in my profession is eight or nine years. I've been at it now for 15, so you see, I'm living on borrowed time. My wife died here six years ago. Sooner or later, an animal, a native, or some sort of disease will get me. But... I have a son in England. Now, the money you're offering would provide for him very nicely until he's old enough to take care of himself. I see. So I'll take your safari. But um, before we leave, I'd like to send the money to England. Uh, you can pay the bonus when we return. You mean if we return? No, 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 no. From now on, we'll say when we return. What I privately think must never darken the spirit of this fine safari. Mr. Quartermain, there's something else on your mind... What is it? I simply don't understand your motives. You don't understand? Or you don't believe them? Well, frankly, I don't. But it's wiser if we don't discuss it, Mrs. Curtis. Why? Well, because on a safari, it's better to travel with people one likes. Oh, in that case, you better tell me now and give me time to recover. Now, what about my motives? Well, it's occurred to me that since your husband's body was never found, you can't inherit his money until you prove that he's dead. One of the reasons my husband went looking for that diamond mine was the possibly foolish hope of finding a fortune of his own. You see, I hold all the wealth there is in the family. Oh, I still don't understand. That I'd be willing to risk my life for my husband. That you propose to throw it away. That's not normal. It has a smell of sickness about it. I happen to love my husband. Or is that something else you can't understand? Perhaps. But I have known people to make elaborate sacrifices for reasons they themselves don't quite understand. Sometimes to expiate a feeling of guilt. If I were you, I'd examine my own motives, Mr. Quartermain. A man who doesn't care whether he lives or dies is not exactly a wholesome specimen. I'm risking my life for a man I love. You're doing it for money. I told you that I had a son no, in Oh, no, it's not your son. There are things you can do for him other than toss your life away. What's your sickness, Mr. Quartermain? Just nothing to live for? I'll meet you in Mr. Master's office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good night, Mr. Quartermain. A few days later, we began our safari. But not until we were well underway did it occur to me that I had failed to thank our guide. It's quite all right, Jack. You don't have to thank me. I must say Elizabeth surprised me. I never knew she could be so persuasive. There's something very persuasive about 5,000 pounds. She's quite a nice girl, really. Definite ideas of her own, of course. Well, like those clothes she's wearing. 
I gather that you didn't quite approve. A tailored suit isn't exactly what I recommended. Well, why don't you tell her? Because she'll find out for herself any moment now. In charge of the natives was Quartermain's personal servant, Keeper. A few minutes later, he reported our first minor difficulty. Walla! 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 Lady sick, Walla! Lady in ox wagon, all oh, very sick. Sick. Something wrong, Mrs. Curtis? No, of course not. I, I just think I prefer to walk for a while. You sure you're all right, Beth? Oh, that old wagon. It's not very comfortable. And the trail, it's nothing but rocks and holes and... She's seasick. I'm perfectly all right. Now, let's go on. In a moment. Just... Just what do you think you're doing? Well, for one thing, I'm going to loosen your jacket and unfasten that collar. Really, Mr. Quartermain, just because Mrs. You're... Curtis, out here, perspiration has got to evaporate or you won't last two hours. You're sealed up like a tin of pears. Kiva, get the lady's box. Now, this may be just the costume for shooting pheasant in Sussex, but it won't do out here, so get behind those bushes and change your clothes. And take off those corsets. You... you wretched man... Oh, you impertinent, unbearable... Hurry up, please. We'll wait here till you're ready. Yes, with each plodding mile of our journey, our complete dependence upon Alan Quartermain became increasingly evident. But a dozen times a day, we'd forget the violence of the heat and the ferocity of the insects in some new and awesome sight of nature, beautiful and terrifying. The elephants that almost charged us. The hippopotami and the crocodiles in the steaming swamp. The frightened zebra, the streaking deer, and the lions that rose up in the trail not 40 feet ahead of us. Stand still. No, I don't shoot. Oh, we, we can't just stand here. Keep quiet. You see? They're walking off. <sighs> I don't believe I could move if I wanted to. Why didn't they attack us? Because they're not hungry. They're not dangerous unless they're hungry. Well, how do you know when they're hungry? Well, if they eat you, Mrs. Curtis, then they're hungry. Oh. Now, look behind those rocks. Ooh. Zebra? Yeah, a fresh kill. In a moment, the vultures will come. Then the lions will return. And after the lions, the jackals. Come on. Manigani, Twendy. The days went by, and we became a little more accustomed, Elizabeth and I, to the endless walking, to a diet of freshly killed meat, and to the ever-present perils that beset strangers in a land where they do not belong. One night after supper... I see that you're looking at the map, Mr. Quartermain. Well, how far have we come? Well, this is where we started from, and now we're, uh, we're somewhere about here. Oh, that took us seven days. We have to head for the Kalawana village, which lies about here. Now, here's the other map, the one Curtis sent you, Jack. It seems to start where your government map ends. That's right. His map starts at the Kalawana village. Well, we know where that is, but we know very little else about them. You've never been among them? I'm a hunter, Mrs. Curtis, not an explorer. No white man has been near the Kalawanas in years. They're feared as much by the natives as they are by the whites. You mean our own natives, too? Yes, we'll probably have trouble persuading them to go much further. Well, we can't even be sure that my husband reached the Kalawanas. No, but we'll inquire of other tribes on the way. How long will it take us? Weeks, months, I don't know. I've never taken a woman on safari before. Have I been such a handicap? No, Mrs. Curtis, but the fun hasn't started yet. When it does, I'm sure we'll all enjoy it. This veldt is the easy part, but we've got jungle and rivers ahead of us. Those natives, what are they chattering about? Probably about deserting us. No, no, no. They're talking about their work. All the money they've earned, about their wives and sweethearts, all the things they're going to do when they get back home. Once in a while, they talk about you. Really? Yeah. They call you Mem Saib Nuwali Nikunda. That means the lady with the flaming hair. You see, they've, they've never seen a redhead before. Oh. And what else? Well, a moment ago, they were saying that you're very fortunate because Buana Alani, that's, uh, that's me, will protect you from lions, leopards, elephants, all the terrors of the jungle. Uh, and what are they saying now? I mean, right now. Well, they, um... To saying that I'm very fortunate too. Mother! Well, Kiva. Cloth house is ready, Mama. 
time to sleep. I'd say he's got the right idea. I've never been so tired in my life. Good night, Ellen. Sleep under the netting and keep your rifle handy. Oh, you tell us that every night. And you wake up every morning, reasonably intact. Good night, Mr. Quartermain. Some hours later, I was awakened by screaming. <coughs> the sort of scream I'd heard before all too many times. I saw Quartermain rushing to Elizabeth's tent. What is it? What's wrong? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't help it. I... A dream? Yes, I, I've had the same dream many times. I'm sorry, I truly am. Get back to sleep. We've two hours yet before daylight. We were at breakfast the next morning when Kiva told Quartermain that some of the native bearers were leaving. Well, isn't there something you can do about it, Mr. Quartermain? No. Nothing. So we may just as well finish our breakfast. What's that going to do to us, Ellen? Nothing I hadn't planned on or warned you about. By the way, did you hear anything last night? I thought I heard someone scream. I didn't hear anything. You must have been dreaming. Excuse me, I, I have to pay the natives off. Beth. Yes? He's quite a decent sort, isn't he? I said he's... Yes, I heard you. Look, about the natives... Are you sure you don't want to go back with the ones who are leaving? Eat your breakfast, Jack. It's getting cold. We'll continue shortly with Act Two of King Solomon's Mines. Meanwhile, here's your Lux Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. The talk of Hollywood, Ken, is the recent premiere in New York of Hans Christian Andersen, the beautiful Technicolor fantasy by Samuel Goldwyn. Released through RKO, it's a charming fairy tale about the most famous storyteller of them all. A treat for everyone from six to 60. Especially since it stars Danny Kaye, Folly Granger, and introduces the new French ballerina, Jean Mare. Yes, and Danny Kaye dances, too, and sings eight new songs. There are dozens of breathtaking dance numbers, an ice skating ballet, a dance of the Little Mermaid that's really dazzling. Yes, Hans Christian Andersen takes you on a glorious trip to fairyland. Jean Mare is one of France's loveliest gifts to Hollywood. Her talent, her beauty, her sparkling, luxe, lovely complexion. Yes, Jean Mayer caught on right away to Hollywood's favorite beauty habit, daily luxe soap facials. Like so many glamorous stars, Jean Mayer finds luxe care makes her skin delightfully smoother, fresher. And you'll find this simple beauty care will work for you, too. You see, daily luxe care has skin tonic action. Yes, a beautifying toning action that helps your skin retain natural moisture, brings new smoothness, dewy freshness. Lux facials are so easy. You simply cream in the rich lather, rinse warm, splash cold. Yes, just this minute a day brings quick new beauty to any normal skin, even dry skin. Try Lux facials tomorrow. Nine out of ten Hollywood stars use Lux. So get this fragrant white beauty soap that's Hollywood's favorite. Remember, Lever Brothers Company guarantees the skin tonic action of Lux Toilet Soap Care will make your skin definitely smoother, definitely fresher. Now our producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Act two of King Solomon's Mind, starring Stuart Granger as Alan Quatermain and Deborah Carr as Beth Curtis. The following week, we reached the jungle. It was as different from the veldt as the veldt had been from Mombasa, but just as overpowering, a dark place filled with secrets. I suppose you had your reasons for warning us, Mr. Quartermain, but if this is jungle, it certainly seems peaceful enough. Well, stop for a moment, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, here's one small area, this little clearing, not half as large, probably, as your own garden at home. Well, right here... There are a thousand creatures, living, reproducing, killing, being killed, eating, being eaten. There's not a square inch that isn't at war if you look for it. You see that log? 
Now watch it when I roll it over. Oh, horrible. Slugs, white slugs, six inches long. And centipedes and crabs and termites. Now, now look over there. I don't see anything. Under that bush. It'll move in a moment. Snake, a green snake. Yes, it's a mamba. One dip from her and you'd stay here. Now look up in the trees. Half the forest lives up there. The apes, monkeys, baboons, a hundred different birds. The vines are so dense you can't even see the sky. In some places, those vines shut out the sun so completely that nothing will ever grow beneath them. Well, let's get moving again. Only, just don't step on that mound up there. Oh, ants! Safari ants. They attack in thousands, giving half the chance they'd eat you, too. Look off there, Jack. Anteater? Yes, you'll find them as soon as we've gone. Eating and being eaten. There's not a creature in the forest that isn't hunted by something else. You watch the cycle of life and death. It seems pointless and endless. But one simple pattern always emerges. One is born, one lives for a time, and then dies. And all the rest is Yuyatsava. Is what? Yuyatsava. <laughs> it's a game that the natives play. It doesn't make a bit of sense. A chases B, B chases C, C chases A. And they turn round and go the other way. Make a great fuss about trying to get things away from each other. Bits of nothing. Twigs, leaves. It's quite pointless, except that the fellow who is here has satisfied his desire to be over there, and everybody's had the fun of running after something that they wanted only because everybody else wanted it. And, well, it's endless. It's a very silly game, you Yotsava. I'm sorry. Sorry? You are sick of life, aren't you? What are you talking about? Motives? Well, you're being very enigmatic about it. No, she's not. She's making very good sense. I suppose I puzzled over motives for most of the day as we struggled on through the jungle. But then something happened that made me forget completely about it. It's all right. Keep it a shot and envelope. Not proper for visitors to call without bringing meat. Visitors? Yeah, we've been watched for more than an hour. These people are the Zahambaris. Now, don't start oh, screaming. Oh, there. there in the bushes. There's a face over there watching us. That's right. Oh, look, there's another. What do they want? Are they surrounding us? No. Then why are they being so quiet? Why don't they say something? There's nothing to say. They know who I am. They're just checking. Alan, we'd better stop. Don't you see those fellows staring at us? Don't worry, Jack. They're acquaintances of Mr. Quatermain with nothing to say, just checking. Kiva, leave a bag of salt with the antelope. I always thought it was beads they wanted. If you had to live here, you'd find a bag of salt worth a hundred times its weight in beads. They're not stupid, you know. But I am. If that's what you mean, why don't you just come out and say so? Mrs. Curtis, I thought we had an understanding that when... <laughs> Look, I, I apologize. Oh, you're so gracious, Mr. Quatermain. Thank you. Um, well, do we, uh, go on? Yes, to the village. Can't be far from here. And beyond the village is the Zahambari River. I'll try to drive a bargain for the use of their boats. Just follow me and stay close. They swarmed about us as we walked into their compound, curious and unsmiling, but friendly enough. <coughs> Alan left us with Kiva and proceeded to start the bargaining with the chief. Almost an hour passed before he returned. Well, they've got boats all right, but and they'll help us cross the river, but not till tomorrow. Tomorrow? Our coming is a big event. There'll be a feast of sorts and a great deal of caterwauling and dancing. If we behave properly and are duly impressed, they'll take us across in the morning. All of us, and our bearers, too. Is that all you talked about, getting across the river? I asked about your husband. The chief claims he remembers him. Well? He says there was another white man with him, a chap with one eye and a scar on his cheek. I hope he's right. That, I know that fellow. He's tough, and he knows the country. Now, come. The chief's invited us to eat. Eat? What? I wouldn't inquire if I were you. Just eat it. It's amazing, really. Your charm, your courtesy, they never fail you, do they? When will you realize where we are and what we're doing? I'd rather not discuss it, do you mind? Once across the river, Alan drove us harder than he ever had before. It was a desperate trek through knee-deep swamps teeming with crocodiles and water snakes. Nor would he halt even when we reached higher ground. 
We made camp only when it was too dark to go any farther. Just look at me. I'm nothing but cuts and scratches and bites. Well, just hold still, dear. This ointment will take the sting out of them anyway. Uh, uh, Beth, I've been thinking. What would you say? Oh, if there's one thing that bothers me more than anything else, it's those horrible centipedes. I've counted 40 varieties. Have you noticed the one that leaves that slimy trail? It's that long, Jack. It's that long. Yes, dear, I know. I think I'll have one stuffed and mounted. It'll make a far more interesting trophy than the usual lions or panthers. Yes, I'll take a panther any day. Or Alan Quatermain. No, he's not a bad sort, Beth. What's wrong between you two? Does something seem wrong? Well, you keep watching each other. Each of you seems to be hoping the other will fall on his face. Beth, I've made a decision. I think we should turn back. I, I just mentioned it to Alan. He's willing if you are. He'd like nothing better than to see me give up. That swamp, I'm sure he took us through it deliberately. Oh, that dreadful man. That's not true, Beth. He asked me this morning if I thought you were up to it. You're being unfair. Nevertheless, we made a poor choice in our selection of a guide. His heart's not in it. I wonder. Oh, look at my hair. I've lost all my hairpins. It's nothing but a trap for every fly, every mosquito, and every ant in the forest. And they... and they bite... Did you ever think of trying pigtails? I remember when you wore them, and very attractive they were. I'm a grown woman, Jack. Mm, well, sometimes I wonder about that, too. Beth, I think you owe that man an apology and some gesture of friendliness. Hmm? Well, he says we'll be eating in 15 minutes. I never want to eat again. Do you know what they served us yesterday in that wretched village? I asked Kiva. Snake. We had snake. Yes, dear. And rather good, I think. There was no further talk of turning back. Elizabeth didn't even mention it, and her determination to continue was expressed perfectly in her hair. Her beautiful hair, of which she was so proud. She cut it off. We were now at the start of the hill country. We stopped at a stream, a waterfall. Well, how was your bath? Very pleasant, thank you. I never thought I'd ever be clean again. Oh, this terrible country. Oh, it's beautiful here. If you'd stop to look around. Yes, I, I suppose it is. What have you done to your hair? I cut it off. Good idea. It's most becoming. Oh, I'm sure it is. I don't dare look in a mirror. Tell me something. If we should find your husband, if you go back to England again, what... Wana! Wana! Kiva! Ah, uh, Kuba! Give me your hand. Hurry. A stranger had come upon our camp. He stood on a rock some distance away. Stood like a statue, staring into space. He was dressed like no other native I had ever seen. Bright colored cloth, almost like a robe. And in his hand, he carried a spear. Good heavens, what a strange looking creature. Alan, who the devil is that? I don't know. How is that, Kasima? Swahili? Dio, Karibu. He wants to know if he can speak to me in Swahili. He, he must be seven feet tall and so thin. I've heard of men like this, but far to the north, beyond Ethiopia. His face, his features, why, they're almost European. Subakeri. Subakeri. Natakanini. Natakakinwenda. Safari Nawa. He wants to join us. Lifwata Sisi Hapa? Ndio. Aiko Banduki Nahapa. Nini Amamingi Sana. He's been following us. He has no rifle, and there are many wild animals here. How did he get this far alone? I don't know, but he needs our help to get through the dark country. He can't make it alone. But why would he want to go into the dark country? Kasa babu, nyaka kwenda nasi. Si, ulisi maswali. He says he doesn't ask questions. Why should I? Well, I don't like him. Why not? Look at him. He's too arrogant. Well, perhaps you've grown too accustomed to subservience. I like him. You're going to turn him down? No, no. Oh, I'd sooner have him with us than tracking us. Nyamenda Campini. Are you sure he said he wanted to go to the dark country? Perhaps he meant he was willing to go. He said he wanted to go. And I'd like to know why. His name was Umbopa. Alan assigned him to me as a gun bearer and we pushed on. But the passing days gave us but little more knowledge about the newcomer. Look at him. I wish we knew what was on that fellow's mind. Every time we make camp, he goes off by himself and stands alone, brooding. 
He never joins the other natives. Still, he seems to like them. They like him. Have you found out any more about him, where he's from? He grew up in the Karabi village. That's hundreds of miles from where we found him. He doesn't say he was born there, just that he lived there with his mother. When she died, he left. He made her a promise or something to visit the dark country. Have you ever noticed the shape of his eyes? Yes. Yes, they're strange, aren't they? The only other place I ever saw eyes like that was in a museum. He's like the ghost of an ancient Egyptian king. That night, our first real disaster occurred. Our native bearers disappeared. They'd run away. They're not only gone, but look, they've stolen half our supplies. Well, we couldn't carry them anyway. They took very little more than what they'd earned. Alan, why did they disappear? Because we've entered the Kalawana country. Well, there are just the five of us now. The three of us, Kiva and Umbopa, which means we must make a decision. Shall we go on or not? Oh, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, I'm being paid. I haven't finished my job yet. Well, that's scarcely the right answer. Beth, please. We've got to weigh our chances. Exactly. And from now on, the conditions of travel will be the same whether we continue or turn back, won't they? But if we turn back and head south, we may be able to pick up some bearers from the friendly tribe. Well, we've come all this way just to get to the Kalawanas. You said yourself that among them we might get the first accurate news of Henry, good or bad. Uh-huh. How about you, Jack? Well, we haven't done too badly. No one likes to give up before he's beaten. Well, then we'll go on. You two wait here. I'll help Kiva remake our pack. I pray we're doing the right thing, Jack. Alan doesn't want to turn back either. Did you ever dream that you were in some dreadful trouble? You're crying for help and people are going by, but nobody hears and no one cares. That's how I think about Henry. That he's alive somewhere. Hoping help will come, but forsaken. That last year, Beth, before Henry left for Africa, I used to feel very sorry for him sometimes. Sorry for him? Whatever for? Someday I'll tell you. Or perhaps someday you'll tell me. Any doubt we may have had of being in the Kalawana country vanished the following day. Far off through the jungle, we heard a sound. A horn of some kind, and its meaning was clear enough. The Kalawanas had found us. These indeed were savages, painted, befeathered, wild and menacing. In the center of their village was the largest hut, obviously the house of their chief. And then a man appeared in the doorway, a white man. You speak English? I speak English. My name's Quatermain. This is Mrs. Curtis and her brother. Just the three of you and the two bearers? For the moment, yes. Lost your other bearers, eh? Too bad. Well, come in, won't you? Before we continue with Act Three of King Solomon's Mines, here's Mr. Cummings to introduce that popular Hollywood commentator, Francis Scully. Hello, Francis. So nice to see you again. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be here, Irving. Last time we met, it was at the preview of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's latest Technicolor epic, Plymouth Adventure. Produced and directed by my good friends Dory Sherry and Clarence Brown. Yes, with those four wonderful, unforgettable stars. Spencer Tracy, Gene Tierney, Van Johnson, and Leo Ginn. And a magnificent story. The exciting adventure of the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower on their heroic voyage to the New World. And highlighted by two great and compelling romances. First, the emotional conflict between Spencer Tracy, the Mayflower's captain, and Gene Tierney, a pilgrim. Then, of course, there's the charming love story between Van Johnson, who plays John Alden, and Dawn Adams as Priscilla. What a treat moviegoers will have in one of the most adventurous sea stories of all times, Plymouth Adventure. Yes, and what a treat it is to look at beautiful Jean Tierney. One glance at her lovely fresh complexion tells you that Jean is faithful, day in and day out, to Lux Soap Facials. Jean knows that a glamorous complexion needs the very finest care. And that's where Lux Toilet Soap comes in. 
Daily Lux Care has skin tonic action that gives your complexion new dewy freshness, romantic softness. Ken, I know so many Hollywood stars who are grateful for the smoothing benefits of Lux Care. And these glamorous stars love Lux in their bath, too, for all over loveliness. Yes, Lux makes your daily bath a delightful beauty treatment. Its creamy, rich lather leaves your skin sweet, fresh, satiny. And even in hardest water, Lux lathers abundantly. Well, I've heard compliments galore about that flower-fresh perfume of Lux. It clings and clings, so you're sure of daintiness. Try Hollywood's favorite beauty pickup. Get the big bath size Lux toilet soap tomorrow. You'll find life's lovely when you're Lux lovely. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> The curtain rises on Act Three of King Solomon's Mind, starring Deborah Carr as Beth Curtis and Stuart Granger as Alan Quatermain. It was incredible, a white man living with the Kaluanas. He stared at us for a moment, and then he started to smile. <laughs> Forgive me. I have not seen a white face for five years. You've been here for five years, Mr... Uh... Smith. Mr. Goodsmith. Yes, I rather like it here. <laughs> now, what are you doing in these parts? We're looking for a man named Curtis. Henry Curtis? He was here? Oh, yes. He passed through here about a year ago. Curtis and another man. Uh, one eye, a scar across his cheek. Where is Henry Curtis now? Please, if there's anything you can tell... I wish I could, ma'am. I wish I could. Mr. Curtis had a notion that there was a desert to the northwest. His bones are probably mouldering in the jungle by now. Is there a desert out there? <laughs> Who knows that, Mr. Quartz of Maine? Nobody ever goes as far as that. Why not? Taboo, legends. What about? Oh, monstrous gods and terrible animals. But not about the desert? No. Not even about diamond mines. No, I know, I know. Curtis was after the mines. Crazy fool. I knew he couldn't last long out there. So I let him go. Are you saying you let Curtis go because you were sure he would die? It was not my business. You've been here for five years, Mr. Smith. You must know these Kaloanas rather well. Are these stories of murder true? Murder? Oh, that is such an unpleasant word. I will tell you this. They are by nature very warlike. Have you heard any rumors about Curtis? From the natives, I mean. Nothing, unless you believe what one eye said when he came back. Came back? Oh, yes, he came back. Alone. Well, what did he say? The natives found him. He was dying. He lasted three or four hours. He died right here in my hut. And they buried him. <laughs> that is, I think they buried him. What did he die of, Mr. Smith? Exhaustion, maybe. Starvation. He said nothing before he died? Uh, he was out of his head, kept talking about burning sun and burning earth. But what did he say about Henry Curtis? Not one word, ma'am. If you ask me, he deserted Curtis and tried to come back. <laughs> well, he almost made it. To these natives, he died because he broke taboo. And sometimes I am not so sure that... <sighs> what are you doing, Mr. Quatermain? If you mean to point that revolver at me, then I advise you that you... Just listen carefully, Mr. Smith. We're getting out of here, and you are taking us. Am I? <laughs> well, maybe so. You had no intention of letting us leave here alive. Your name's Van Bruen. I've had your description for years. You know this man? He's wanted for murder in Nairobi. And he said he had let Henry go because he was sure to die. But you're not so sure about us, are you? 
So you're going to get us out of here before those callow earners start carrying out your orders? I am not so sure that I am able to control them, Mr. Quatermain. You'll walk out first. We'll be right behind you. Elizabeth, you know what this means. Are you ready? Yes, I'm... I'm ready. All right, Mr. Smith, start walking. The Kalawanas watched us, but they made no move to attack or follow. But once we were in the jungle again, the beat of their drums and the weird sound of their war cries were all too clear in the distance. They wanted the sport of pursuit before they ran us down and killed us. We ran as long as we could with Alan still keeping Smith covered, and then... Get up here with us. You've got to keep up with us. I can't keep up. I just can't. Hey, keep it. Get my rifle. Keep him covered. Please, Elizabeth. You've got to try. If we can shake them off for just a few minutes... Move it up! Somehow, Smith had wrested the rifle away from Kiever and killed him. But Umbopa, too, had fired, and Smith's brief grasp of freedom was over. And then, Umbopa was saying something to Alan. Uh -huh. He's going out to make a false trail. He's going to lead them the other way. Now, we've still got to run for it, Elizabeth. All right, then I'll carry it. Straight ahead, Jack. Bear to your left and hurry. <laughs> When we were able to go no farther, we struggled up the vines into the dense covering of a giant tree. For hours, we could hear the Kalawanas combing the jungle for us. But gradually, their cries grew fainter and fainter, and we had escaped. Elizabeth, it's all right. It's all right. Oh, Alan, Alan. We're safe now. Rest. Just try to rest. You're not leaving me? No. Oh, when you're close to me like this, I... Just shut your eyes. I've behaved so badly, Alan. Have you? No. Not really. If I've seemed angry with you, it's only because you matter so much to me. Nothing must happen to you. With the coming of daylight, I saw that we were not alone. Umbopa had returned. He was standing motionless, quite as we had first seen him, staring off into the distance. It's difficult to recall in detail our escape from the jungle or the number of days that passed before we were done with it. But the moment came when we stood at its edge and caught our first sight of what next lay before us. It's the desert. Look, it's the desert. The map was right. But where does it end? The map doesn't say that, does it? Oh, we'll have to cross it somehow. And we'll stay here until dark and go by night. It'll be too hot out there to travel by day. There may even be a diamond mine out there. If the map was right about the desert, it may be right about the mine. I'll be happy if it's right about the water hole. We'll need water more than diamonds. Alan, have you ever thought about the problem of... of getting back? Yeah. I was hoping no one would ever mention that. But uh, we can always sprout wings and fly back to England. Oh, you're being awfully cheerful about it. Well, for one thing, I don't care. I want to see what's out there. And I have a feeling that when the mist's clear, we're going to see mountains. Well, they're clear, clearly marked on the map. Smith said that one eye talked about burning earth and burning sand. That means that Henry Curtis reached this desert. And if the water hole is where the map says it is, he may have reached that too. Then you do have a hope that Henry may still... I didn't say that. It's been more than a year. Well, I shall never give up hope. Never. Yes, we could see the mountains far across the desert. They were five days away. But it was not the will of Providence to bring us safely through the Velton jungle, only that we should perish now. We reached the waterhole, rested there for two days, and at long last arrived at the plateau at the foot of the mountains. And there, once again, this strange, wild country brought into view a sight that left us all but speechless. Good heavens. It, it's a valley. Miles and miles of valley. Alan, look. Why, it's just like the English countryside. Temperate country in the heart of Africa. Oh, we've been climbing ever since we left that waterhole. 
This plateau must be much higher than the desert. Well, oh, even Umbopa seems impressed. What do you think? He's found something. Yes, he's pointing to that mound of rocks. Some natives bury their dead that way. Bury their dead? There's a marker on the rocks, a rifle. Take it down. See what it looks like. It says it's Henry's rifle. What makes you so sure? There's a message scratched on the stock. Here, read it. Ammunition gun, heading northwest. Inform my wife, 73 Grosvenor Square, London, Henry Curtis. He's alive out there somewhere. Elizabeth, you wait here with Jack. I'll take him, Bopper, and look around a bit. Beth. Yes? You said someday you'd tell me. You said you'd tell me. You weren't in love with Henry. You treated him badly. That's why he left England. That's about it. Hasn't this trip been penance enough? More than enough. In more ways than you can guess. But I think I can guess. It's Alan, isn't it? He loves you, Beth, and you... Oh, the human heart's a strange thing. When I started on this trip, I was very confused. I thought my motives were so noble. But Alan guessed the truth the first time I met him. It was guilt. I know it now, and I'm better for knowing it. The nightmares are over. But another sort of nightmare seems to be beginning. What are we to do? Can't we face that when we come to it? I have a feeling we'll be facing it sooner than... Oh, look. Alan's waving at us. He, he's calling us. Come, quickly. As we reached Alan, he was pointing down the mountain trail. There, a hundred yards away, at the mouth of a small canyon, stood Mbopa, and around him were half a dozen men. Like Mbopa, they were very tall and thin. Their faces bore the same almost Semitic features, and again, like Mbopa, they wore brightly colored toga-like garments. But strangest of all was their conduct. They were touching their hands to the ground and then to their foreheads. Bewildered, we looked at Alan. These are his people. Mbopa's come home. They're bowing their heads. They're, they're saluting him. Yes. It appears we've been traveling with a king. He just told me. These people are the Watutsi. When he was a boy, his throne was taken away from him by his cousin. Well, he's come back to claim it. You mean those men recognize him, but if he's been gone for years... There's a mark on his body, the figure of a snake. Every time a king is born, they carve that snake on him. He wants me to join them. Diego! Alan, about... about Henry... Yes, of course. I'll find out whatever I can. Alan was with the Watutsi for several moments. When he returned, he had much to tell us. Well, for one thing, a couple of the men have agreed to lead us to the village. I think we should go. Think we should go? Isn't Umbopa going? No, no. He says there's trouble there. Why didn't the men talk to you? Well, they speak a dialect I've never heard before. If we go to the village, we'll have difficulty making ourselves understood. You said there was trouble. Well, it seems the present king is not a very nice fellow. One of them, the old man, says there's a civil war brewing. And with Mbopa returning? Exactly. It can very easily come to a head. Almost half the village is scattered now among these hills. The rebels. Mbopa wants to talk to them first. Well, then why don't we stay here with him? Because one of the men told Mbopa that a white man had come to their village before. Alan. Yes. Your husband. It's almost a certainty. Then I want to go to the village now. Well, it promises to be quite exciting. Exciting? I'm sorry. Well, let's get ready. From the first moment of our meeting with King Twala and his followers, their arrogance left little doubt that we were in unfriendly hands. True, it was impossible to know what they were talking about, but it was uncomfortably clear that they regarded us with scorn and amusement. Well, at least we know if we're ever going to find Henry Curtis, we'll find him here. How can you still be so certain? Did you look at the headpiece the king is wearing and the witch doctors? Those stones are diamonds, uncut diamonds. King Solomon's mines. But we also know what their intentions are. Well, they seem to respect the power of our rifles. We'll be safe for a while. But you said our ammunition's almost gone. That's something they don't know. Alan, you kept repeating Henry's name. You kept asking them. Yes, and they recognized it. And as near as I can tell, they mean to take us to him. Hold them up! 
They're calling to us. They want us to follow them. And we'd better go. It's just one more chance we'll have to take. Well, at least it will soon be over, one way or another. Alan, there's something I want to tell you. I must tell you. It's all right, Beth. There's nothing to say that I don't know. Thank you. A dozen Watutsi led us out of the village. About a mile away, at the base of a rocky crest, was an entrance to a cave. They lighted torches and gave them to us. But only one of them came with us. It was a labyrinth inside, dark twisting channels and lurching shadows. At almost every turn, there was a choice of passageways, but our leader never hesitated. And then, suddenly, a vast chamber opened before us. A low vaulted room filled with weirdly shaped stalagmites and a constant sound of dripping water. And here, our leader paused. Did you chum tell me? I come apart. My left me. He's... He's pointing at something. Just keep your rifle ready. Alan, they're chests, stone chests, filled with diamonds, diamonds. Oh! There on the floor of the cave was a human skeleton. Alan put his arm around Beth and led her away. On one of the fingers was a ring. Yes, we had found Henry Curtis. When I looked up, we were alone. The Watutsi had disappeared. And then we knew what had been planned for us. He had loosened the rocks and sealed the entrance of the cavern. It's hopeless. We'll never dig our way out of here. The only end of this is suffocation. Alan, Alan, wait. Our torches, look at the torches. Well? They're burning as brightly as ever. We've been in here for hours. The torches should be going out from lack of oxygen. Well, then there's air coming in from somewhere. Give me that torch. Slowly, carefully, he crept around the walls of the cavern. And then abruptly he stopped, for the flame of the torch was reacting to a draft of air. There's a crevice in the rocks. The rocks are loose. Come on, give me a hand. I, I can hear something. Water. Running water. Hold on a minute. It's a stream. A stream. And streams have to lead somewhere. Then we've still got a chance. All right, Jack. Come on, lift her with the rocks. An hour later, we stumbled out of the stream into the bright sunlight of the mountainside. We were close to the village again, but hidden from their sight. There was great activity below us. Something of vital importance was taking place. And they're celebrating our death, probably. Elizabeth, can you go on? The sooner we get out of here, the better. But where could we go? Anywhere. Perhaps we'll find Mbopa. At least we're... in the village. Look, they're in the compound. They're fighting Mbopa and the king. But how could he have come near the village? If the king found Mbopa, why wasn't he killed? It seems to me I've read about this sort of thing somewhere. Yes, perhaps they're not quite the ignorant savages we so often think they are. What are you talking about? An ancient custom. When there are two claimants to a throne, they must settle it by hand-to-hand -hand combat. They discover that it saves war and bloodshed. And, and if I were you, Beth, I'd, I'd turn my head and look the other way. When the awful struggle was over, the Watutsi had a new king the rightful king, Umbopa. And the simple kindnesses we may have shown to him were now returned to us a thousandfold. No, not with the diamonds of King Solomon's mines, but with all that we might need in men and supplies to see us safely back to civilization. Once again, we started on safari. Beth, I'm... I'm not much good at apologies. You owe me no apologies, Alan. <laughs> For what I said the night of our first meeting... But you were right. You were right, too. You said I was sick of living. But suddenly, life never looked so good to me. In a moment, our stars will return. How you hate to hear this question. Do you know you have a run in your stocking? When you hear those words, it's too late to do anything about the run. But you can cut future stocking runs in half. 
It's so simple. Just never let harsh washings with strong wash day products wear out your stockings in the wash. Delicate nylons need delicate care. So give your nylons the best care in the world. Always wash them gently in Lux Flakes. Safe Lux Flakes melt completely into a silky cleansing foam. And each washing in Lux Flakes has a special action that keeps nylon threads strong as new, washing after washing, wearing after wearing. Stockings washed in pure Lux Flakes stay lovely twice as long. In fact, 95% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. So save money, save stockings. Start Lux Flakes stocking care tomorrow. Safe Lux Flakes are guaranteed by Lever Brothers Company. Now here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And our heartiest congratulations to Stuart Granger and Deborah Carr. It was quite an experience accompanying you two on a safari. If you think that was an experience, you should have been there when we made the picture. Stuart actually is a big game hunter, you know. Yes, I believe he shot five wild buffalo and two rhinoceros on the trip. Wasn't that rather dangerous, Stuart? Well, it's more dangerous if you don't shoot them. <laughs> big game hunting is a thrilling experience, but somehow I couldn't interest Deborah in it. No, indeed. I was just grateful for plenty of Lux soap. We all got incredibly dirty. And besides, Lux toilet soap is a wonderful complexion care. And after seeing you in Prisoner of Zender, in which Stuart does some sensational dueling, and you, Deborah, are gorgeous in Technicolor. I think you both know what's best for you. Well, Deborah doesn't mind a little exercise like tramping through a jungle, but nothing strenuous, mind you. <laughs> like all the swimming Esther Williams does in her new Technicolor picture, Million Dollar Mermaid. Well, she doesn't swim through a swamp, Deborah. She does some wonderful aquatic routines and co-stars with Walter Pigeon, Vic Mature for romance. Ah, uh, romance. That's what everyone likes. So for next week, we've chosen another fine metro goldwyn Mayer picture filled with romantic comedy. It's the charming screen hit, Strictly Dishonorable. And in her original role, we have one of the most fascinating actresses in Hollywood, Janet Lee. And as our co-star, a handsome actor who has soared to stardom, Fernando Lamas. It was a delightful picture. Good night. Good night. Good night and all good wishes. Now here is Ken Carpenter with news about Mouthhead. Ken? Millions of Americans have found that Chlorodent toothpaste does more to give you a clean, fresh mouth than any other dentifrice. And now here is proof that Chlorodent gives a healthier mouth, too. Chlorodent was tested under the supervision of dentists at Father Flanagan's famous boys' town in Nebraska. In this test, Chlorodent and a fine white toothpaste were used regularly by different groups of youngsters. And in just 60 days, three quarters of the boys using Chlorodent showed dramatic improvement in mouth health. Chlorodent was actually proved twice as effective for quickly reducing acute gingivitis as the fine white toothpaste that did not contain chlorophyll. And that's another reason why Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees that Chlorodent does more for you than any other dentifrice, white, ammoniated, or chlorophyll, to give you a clean, fresh, healthy mouth. Yes, a clean, fresh, healthy mouth. Make sure you get the toothpaste used in this test. Chlorodent. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Janet Lee and Fernando Lamas in Strictly Dishonorable. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Michael Pate as John, Leo Brett as Eric, Bob Griffin as Umbopa, William Conrad as Smith, and Eddie Marr as Kiva. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett from the Metro Goldwyn Mayer picture, King Solomon's Mind. Screenplay by Helen Deutsch, based on the novel by H. Ryder Haggard. Our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. Trust Silver Dust. Trust Silver Dust. Trust Silver Dust to give you more for your money with a goodwill offer that's really a honey. Trust Silver Dust. New, improved Silver Dust Wonder Bubble Suds for laundry and dishes now makes you this amazing goodwill offer. 
Inside every large size silver dust, you get, as an extra, a genuine Canon face cloth. It's big, soft, fluffy, lovely pastel colors, worth up to 15 cents. Remember, in large size silver dust, you get this genuine Canon face cloth as an extra. Try silver dust. See how it safely digs out dirt, gets clothes cleaner, speeds dishwashing, kind to your hands. Yes, silver dust, a great washing product with a Canon face cloth inside, gives you more for your money than any other washing product. That's guaranteed. Get the large size box of silver dust with the big Canon face cloth as an extra today. Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees the quality and performance of Lux Toilet Soap, Lux Flakes, Chlorodent Toothpaste, and Silver Dust, or your money refunded. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Strictly Dishonorable, starring Janet Lee and Fernando Lamas. This is the CBS Radio Network. And KNX Los Angeles, where the KNX Mystery Voice Contest is now in progress. It's light. It's golden clear. It's a truly fine pale beer. Bürgermeister, Bürgermeister, it's so light and golden clear. Bürgermeister, Bürgermeister, it's a truly fine pale beer. San Francisco Brewing Corporation, San Francisco.